Mm. I usually begin by asking people hard questions who sit in the back. Good afternoon, my name is John O'Brien. I'm head of communications with MCC Brussels and welcome to this panel confronting the politicization of the curriculum. Maybe it all started very innocently, um, like the road to hell being paved with good intentions. The desire perhaps to break down classroom walls, to make learning more situated in life outside the school or life outside the college lecture hall. Some schools in the United States began to refer to themselves as schools without walls and promoted the idea that learning can and should happen everywhere. Teachers told kids to bring newspapers to the classroom. We discussed a TV program or the upcoming elections. 2.5 million students in the US were watching when the ill-fated Challenger spacecraft take off, or rather not. Of course, there was 2.5 reasons then to have therapy for all the students who watched that terrible crash. Maybe though it began with problem-based learning, a teaching method in which complex real-world problems are used as the vehicle to promote student learning of concepts and principles as opposed to direct presentation of facts and concepts. In addition to course content, Problem-based learning, believers said it promoted the development of critical thinking skills, problem-solving abilities, and communication skills. It also, they said, provided opportunities for working in groups. So you will not be in favor of it, Frank, right? <laughs> Finding, <laughs> evaluating research materials and lifelong learning. Then, regardless of intention, something felt wrong, or something went very wrong. At some point, it seems that politicians spend more time on attempting to re-engineer education policy than almost anything else. Every social problem, from climate to racism, is the subject of a campaign to address it through the education system. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, seems to feature in almost every classroom subject. Maybe it was less about bringing students out into the world but rather some political views, some political views into the classroom. What happens to the education system when politicians seem to turn it into a solution to all social woes? The main result seems to be that education is perhaps more ideologically, uh, ideological now than ever before, reshaping people to hold the right values, the right opinions, the right beliefs, seems to be the chief role of education policy today. How should we respond to the saturation of education policy by political imperatives? Many would be quite happy to replace progressive indoctrination with an alternative, conservative brand. But such simplistic reversals seem blind to the real problem. With no authority of its own, the crucial distinction between education and the rest of life is lost. Should we seek to root out the DEI disease from education and replace it with more conservative values? Or do we need an alternative approach altogether? They are some of the questions we're going to be dealing with this afternoon. And I'm going to say to you now, we have a value at MCC Brussels, and it is that the audience is very important. Your participation is very important. So as we go along, I'm going to suggest to you to make a note of a particular view or a particular question you have, because I will be coming out into the audience to ask you what you think, whether you put up your hand or not. <laughs> Our first speaker today is Joanna Williams. She's founder of CIEO and the author of a wonderful book, which I'd recommend you check out, How Woke Won. She's also a columnist with Spiked Magazine. 
Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, my starting point this afternoon is that education is thoroughly politicised nowadays, that every aspect of education has been uh, absolutely 100% imbued with political <laughs> objectives, and that this takes three main forms. Uh, the first I would outline is the addition of new subjects which are inherently political in nature into the school timetable. So these are things like sexuality education, which focuses on gender identity and relationships and seeks to intervene in the most intimate areas of people's lives, or citizenship classes, which look to cultivate particular attitudes to the nation and the environment. Uh, the second way the politicisation uh, can be seen is in the changed content of more traditional academic subjects. Uh, for example, geography lessons, which focus on sustainability and environmentalism, a literature, which is used as a vehicle for exploring attitudes towards race and gender, and, and history, which becomes about the sins of the nation state. Uh, the third way I, I would discuss is the extra, we could call it, or the hidden curriculum, what, what it is that pupils are learning from being in the school environment, but outside of timetabled lessons. So this might be through assemblies with invited in guest speakers from campaigning organizations, uh, charity days, awareness raising weeks and days, uh, the posters that are on display around the school, and even policies about school uniform and behavior. Schools that have gender neutral uniforms, for example, or gender neutral toilets uh, display rainbow flags or, or tolerate um, displays of policy, uh, Palestinian solidarity, uh, but won't show pictures of Muhammad in civics classes. So those are the three kind of key ways in which I'm arguing that school has been thoroughly politicized. New subjects, changed content of more traditional academic subjects, and a hidden or extra curriculum. But I'm not going to go into detail examples of how this is occurring now. We could perhaps come back to that in the discussion. Rather, what I want to do is to explore how the situations come about. And, and I also want to argue that why I agree with John, you know, it's no good for us just to uh, kind of take out a progressive ideology and substitute in a conservative ideology. But I think we do have to recognize that uh, classical education it is, I think, an inherently conservative, small c, conservative project um, that is inherently linked to a sense of national identity. And I don't think we should be ashamed or embarrassed about making that point. So first of all, then, on, on where this has come from. So, that, so I would argue that the complete politicization of education has been well over a century uh, in the making. I think that's the first point. You know, this is not a new phenomenon. This is a very, very old phenomenon now. Also, the thing I'd like to point out is uh, the extent to which this is, uh, uh, to, to some degree at least, a conscious political project. It's not something which has just arisen by accident. So I'm, I'm going to kick off with John Dewey, as I know other people have done as well over the course of today. Um, in uh, Education and Democracy, which was published in 1916, uh, Dewey says, as, a, as a society becomes more enlightened, it realizes that it is responsible not to transform transmit and conserve the whole of its existing achievements, but only such as make for a better future society. Now, he's clearly right about the idea of selection. I think that's relatively uncontroversial, but it's the final phrase in that sentence that I really want to pick up on, but only such as make for a better future society. It bends education to an instrumental purpose while appearing to leave open the question of what comprises a better future society. But ironically, I think given the title of his book is Democracy in Education, it's not the general public, it's not a national conversation that Dewey is looking to instigate, uh, or even elected representatives at this stage. It's very clearly teachers or curriculum makers who Dewey thinks should be responsible for determining what a, a better future society might look like. So for Dewey, um, this process of educating for a better society poses a direct challenge to the past. Uh, he argues the study of past products will not help us understand the present because the present is not due to the products but to the life of which they were the products. What, what he means by this is that knowledge of the past and knowledge from the past it's not, not so much that it's unimportant, but that it, it's just a resource in developing the future. 
So I think Dewey really does two main things. He, he uproots education uh, by separating it from the past, and he also cuts it from a national conversation by leaving it to educators to determine what, he, what they perceive as being the better future society that education should be exploited to create. Now, we know that Dewey's work has been highly influential in the US and beyond. He articulated an elite zeitgeist, however, so I'm not suggesting that Dewey kind of just plucked these ideas is out of nowhere, uh, and he alone is responsible for all that bad that's happened ever since. What he was doing was he was articulating a zeitgeist that was already out there. Uh, and he he um, kind of put into words, if you like, an elite feeling that was already becoming far less confident about its own place in the world. But his influence can be traced then in, in theorists who've written since. Most notably, I think, in somebody who's not so much heard of nowadays, but was very influential in American teacher training colleges uh, in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, this is a guy called George Counts. Um, his once widely read pamphlet was, was titled, A Dare the School Build a New Social Order. And this was published in 1932. Uh, and Counts shows the extent to which education, even at that point, was already being used uh, to solve social problems. Uh, faced with any difficult problem of life, he writes, uh, we set our, our minds at rest sooner or later by the appeal of the school. Now, he wasn't saying that as a negative. He wasn't saying that as a criticism like we might do today. Uh, for Counts, this was a, a kind of a plus point. This, this was something good. Uh, like Dewey then, Counts sees education connect, education's connection to the past as a problem of the existing school, he writes, almost everywhere it is in the grip of conservative forces and is serving the cause of perpetuating ideas and institutions suited to an age that is gone. So Counts takes much from the progressive education movement, which Dewey had, had kind of described, and he describes this, but Counts describes um, uh, progressive education, he's actually quite critical of it, he describes it as being completely devoted to the promotion of social wealth Welfare through education. And if you, that, that's, that's what he considers to be good about it. Sorry, and I'll come on to his criticisms in a second. He, he thinks it's good that education is completely dedicated to social welfare. But if we turn this phrase around, uh, we see it also means the complete use of education to promote social welfare. Uh, and if we swap social welfare for social justice, I think we have a very good indication of where schools are at today. So what, what, do we dis, uh, well, sorry, what counts dislikes about child-centered education, he describes describes it as being too vague, anarchic, sentimental, open-minded, and individualistic. So he does have some quite damning uh, criticisms. So his we its weakness, he says, is that it has elaborated no theory of social welfare. So if it counts, if an educational movement is to describe itself as progressive, it must have orientation, it must possess uh, direction. It must know where it is progressing to. So he argues education needs to become less frightened than it is today. And this is kind of quite a chilling sentence to read now. He argues education needs to become less frightened than it is today at the bogies of imposition and indoctrination. So he's kind of bigging up imposition and indoctrination. He points out that teachers, if they could increase sufficiently their stock of courage, intelligence and vision, might be a social force of some magnitude. So he's kind of preempting the teacher activist in this way and, and trying to bring the teacher activist into life. So for count schools become centers for the building and not merely the contemplation of our civilization, uh, led by teachers who are political actors, arguing for a, uh, a particular vision of social welfare among citizens in the community while imposing this vision on future citizens in the classroom. And again, you know, I'm asking you to remember that this is from 1932, so this is before the Second World War. But again, you know, you see two dominant trends really occurring in parallel, the hollowing out of knowledge from the past and knowledge of the past, and its replacement with instrumental social goals, which are ultimately to be determined by the teacher. 
So it would take several decades for such ideas to migrate from the US and become embedded in schools around the world. Yet by the late 1960s and 1970s, uh, thinkers such as Basil Bernstein in the UK and Pierre Bourdieu in France were challenging the idea that education should be concerned with traditional bodies of curricular knowledge uh, and arguing that the canon was a reflection of upper-class tastes uh, when really what was needed was relevance. The rallying cry into the 1970s of education for democracy led to calls for teachers to break the tyranny of subjects. And this meant to turn towards emotion, often in the interior life of the child, which we touched on in the previous session, or focused on in the previous session. Um, the, the goal described at this time was the creation of feeling intellects, able in empathy, but the main political focus was on tackling social problems. In the 1960s and the 1970s, this was poverty, you know, the kind of a discovery, if you like, of poverty. The tyranny of subjects then uh, became replaced by a tyranny of relevance. Um, two British educators, again writing a long, long time ago now, it seems a long time ago, 1970, the solution to poverty requires the redistribution of social power Self-confidence, no less than material welfare, is a crucial lack of the poor. So it's not lack of money, it's, a lack, it's lack of self-confidence. Education, they come to schools, if it is to succeed in encouraging people's full capabilities, must start out as training for community action, for self-help and mutual defence. So again, you've got this real creation of the activist teacher um, put to the cause of challenging poverty um, 50 years ago. So over the past five decades, I would argue, the specific goals of education have changed. Today, they're less focused, teachers are less focused on poverty, welfare and class, and more focused on gender, race, identity and social justice. Uh, but the politicisation of education is complete because arguments that schools should break with the past and serve the present through political or more recently psychological goals determined by teachers began a century ago, and I would argue were pretty much won 50 50 years ago. So finally, just to conclude, I would argue we can't challenge this, this politicisation of, of education through arguing for a blank slate or value-free education. I would argue that for education to be meaningful, it must be rooted in the past, as I've described it here, a, a, a kind of process of involving children, initiating children into a conversation based on both knowledge of the past and knowledge from the past. And I think this makes it an inherently conservative project, educators are conserving within individual children, culture and tradition. And for this reason, I would argue education is also inherently connected to the project of the nation. When teachers select from the whole of civilization's achievements, they look not exclusively, but certainly primarily, I would argue, or they should look primarily, to a national tradition uh, from which to draw universal truths about the human condition. Again, you know, we also find precedence for this argument over a century ago. Uh, so I'm running out of time on it. I'll skip a little bit. I'll skip a bit. Um, uh, let's come right up to date now, oh, sorry, more, more recently, very more recently, just to end with. Uh, Roger Scruton, in I think a book that he wrote, which I very much recommend, very much enjoyed reading, called Culture Counts. Uh, he writes that in order to create the deep attachment on which the future of our civilization depends, we need to affirm our right to exist. And by that he means the right of Western civilization to exist. A culture uh, which Scruton describes as a source of knowledge, a emotional knowledge concerning what to do and what to feel is central to this affirmation. It's through art, uh, Scruton argues, that people develop a relation of belonging. Uh, he's unashamedly concerned with high culture, but he argues that although an elite product, uh, its meaning lies in emotions and aspirations that are common to all. Uh, for Scruton, Western civilization is synonymous with the Enlightenment, with its aspiration towards universal truth. Uh, he's scathing of postmodernists who believe the power of those who, up, uh, who, who trace belief, sorry, to the power of those who uphold it, because this undermines its claims to objectivity. Uh, Scruton insists that Western culture is a repository of knowledge and not a form of ideology. Like Durkheim, he sees education as being about far more than relevance and skills. Its aim, he contends, is to open pupils' minds and feelings to the underlying oneness of the human condition. And to very, very finally conclude, I would argue we fail in this project if we 
allow education to be turned to political ends. Okay, thank you very much. And to help continue the conversation today, all the way from Poland, Liliana Schmetsch is president of the Warsaw Institute. Sorry, I have so many things in my hands, you know. <laughs> all right, so first of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the MCC Brussels, but also the uh, Learning Institute of MCC in Budapest for the invitation and uh, great uh, conference. And I would like to start my short speech with a short anecdote of what happened during one of my classes, because I also teach at the university, at the Krakow University of Economics. And I'm always trying to start uh, my classes with some kind of a short um, quiz game to actually assess how big, how broad is the knowledge of my students. And they are mainly the first year of bachelor, uh, students or the first year of, uh, of master's students. And one of the questions that I have asked them was, what are the four freedoms of the European single market? Do you have any guesses? What did they come up with? And it would be actually, I believe, the, uh, the answer to the uh, question of our debate, uh, the politicization of the education. So actually nobody uh, thought about the free movement of goods, Nobody thought about the free movement of capital, and nobody thought about the free movement of people, nor the uh, freedom to establish and provide services. But imagine, they said the freedom of sex, which was a big surprise for me, and, uh, and the freedom of speech. Sorry, I have some throat problems. So I believe that's actually the answer, and I'm talking about the Polish case, not the American nor the Canadian. So we can all agree that Polish education needs some broad and profound change. Not just the low salaries of teachers, uh, the lack of prestige actually of the teaching position that is present uh, nowadays, the overloaded core uh, curriculum that is not actually adapted to the times and needs of the students, and tired and unmotivated students are just some of the ills of the Polish schooling. And I'm not only talking about the primary school, high schools, but mainly about the higher uh, education like uh, universities. Over the last 30 or maybe even 50 years, um, content-wide, there has been relatively little change in the Polish education system. Mentally, we still stand and to educate factory workers. Well, I'm not feeling very confident speaking about uh, you know, the bad things of the Polish educational system and to complain because in the past it was mainly the duty of the EPP uh, members of the parliament, but uh, now the situation has changed a little bit. Um, so in the Prussian uh, model in the past, uh, we tried to implement the universal knowledge to everyone, but as we can see, it's not working anymore nowadays. Uh, and regarding the politicization of, uh, of the education system, actually every government that comes into power is changing everything. Everything. Just to show, just to prove that actually the previous government did everything in the wrong way. Even if they did something good, no, they will just change everything uh, just for the sake of the principle. And actually that's what's happening right now in Poland. Uh, our current education minister has announced uh, the withdrawal of homeworks so in primary schools. So now uh, the kids uh, will not have any, any, any homeworks. And actually, there is a result that the teacher can no longer expect the students to, for example, learn a poem at home, nor read a book at home. And I believe, as we all know from our experience, School is one part of the education, but much bigger part is actually at home, learning how to read, how to calculate, but nowadays the teacher cannot actually expect it. Uh, also, the new government has announced a slimming down of the 
core curriculum. There will be less material in physics, chemistry, biology, geography, but as well as history and Polish language. Uh, for some of you, it might be an interesting uh, information. Romeo and Juliet will be no longer in our canon of books. I have just read it a couple of minutes uh, ago. Um, also, the, the level uh, of teaching of these subjects and actually the use of the human capital determines the success of our economy. And looking what's happening right now in Poland, uh, looking not just at the educational uh, changes, but also actually the lack of investments uh, and uh, the idea to stop some of the most important investments like the nuclear power plant, uh, actually, it somehow gives me um, an idea that our economy might become less competitive in the future if we connect all of the dots all together. However, we also need to take into account uh, from the previous years that it is actually not possible to reinvent history uh, subject and also uh, teach history uh, to children in a very biased way. We cannot do this. We cannot do this. Um, so what I can say, the uh, educational reform is a very big challenge because every new government is changing everything from the beginning. But I'm also an academic, I'm also teaching at the, at the university, and what I'm encountering every year, every month, is actually that uh, young people, they don't know what's happening in the world. They have no idea what's happening in the US, they have no idea what's happening um, in the EU, they have no idea. So uh, their main interests are social media, new shoes, and also new thing, a leap augmentation within the uh, younger generation. So my job as a teacher um, is not easy uh, nowadays, so I'm trying to teach the students how to think how to think independently, how to quarrel, how to express their views, even if they are different from my own, because they are scared from time to time to express their own views. And the most important thing, to connect the dots. Thank you. Uh, to round out our speakers today, Tim Crowley, a lecturer in philosophy from University College Dublin, uh, the Euro um, cradle of woke <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> okay, well, last speaker at the last panel of a long day, or a long two days for some of us. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'd like to um, just maybe begin by reflecting a little bit on our, on our theme. Uh, our discussions today and yesterday have revolved around the question of classical education and how to reclaim it. But, as Socrates might have put it, how can we reclaim classical education without first knowing what it is? Now, we seem to mean something like education in the classical tradition. I'm sounding like my supervisor there. Just, re re just turn the words around and make it sound like I've said something profound. So. Education in the classical tradition, we all agree with that. But what is classical? The Polish philosopher and historian, Tatarkiewicz, I know there's Polish speakers, I hope I haven't butchered the, the pronunciation. Tatarkiewicz identified four meanings of classical. One was an aesthetic category, with reference to authors and works that possess harmony, measure, equilibrium. Another was as an historical style, referring to moderns who imitate ancient models. A third was perhaps the most common use, the one that perhaps comes first to mind, the use of classical to denote a chronological period, a synonym for Greco-Roman antiquity. And much of our discussion has pointed at times towards the Greeks and Romans, particularly in terms of the question as to whether learning the languages of Greek and Latin must be at the heart of an education that one may call classical. But perhaps the most interesting meaning, and arguably what we are ultimately trying to discern when we talk of a classical education is, is this. Classical in the sense of denoting value. Something that is first class, perfect, as opposed to what is imperfect, indeed mediocre. So we want to reclaim a first class education. Now this still raises questions. What does a first class education consist of? 
because presumably a demand for a first-class education is one held by all educational reformers and visionaries. For despite appearances or consequences, we might try to concede that every educational innovation is well-meaning. Presumably no one sets out deliberately to deliver a program of mediocre education, not even John Dewey. Still, what is it? Is it a question of the sort of subjects that are taught? Or is it a question of the style of teaching? And we must not lose sight of the further question, why do we need to reclaim it? Evidently, the feeling is that education in the classical tradition, whatever it is, has been lost. Now, for some clarity here, I think it's worth turning to the thoughts of Dorothy Sayers on this issue. And a, spe a, spe <laughs> laughter. a speech she uh, delivered at Oxford in 1947 on education. Here, Sayers sets out to inquire whether, as she puts it, we are really teaching the right things in the right way. And what she says, I believe, may help with our own inquiries, for she too evidently thinks that we have lost something, something valuable, and needs to reclaim it. Indeed, she entitled her speech, The Lost Tools of Learning. And moreover, she offers what I think is a very persuasive account of what exactly it is that we have lost. For to teach things the right way, she argues, is to teach how to learn. She writes, Is it not the great defect of our education today that although we often succeed in teaching our people's subjects, we fail lamentably on the whole in teaching them how to think? They learn everything except the art of learning. And for an appreciation for the art of learning, Sayers writes, We must turn back the wheel of progress some four or five hundred years before Bacon, Anthony, to the point at which education began to lose sight of its true object towards the end of the Middle Ages. She is speaking of the medieval syllabus of the trivium and quadrivium, the seven so-called liberal arts. More particularly, she is interested in the first part, the trivium, consisting of grammar, dialectic, rhetoric. The trivium, as Sayers puts it, was not learning, but a preparation for learning. It gave the tools for learning, and this is what she thinks has been lost. First, the pupil learns grammar, meaning the structure of language. Not simply learning a foreign language so that one might order a coffee or buy a train ticket, but learning the nuts and bolts of language. What it was, how it was put together, how it worked. Secondly, he learned dialectic, how to, how to use language, how to define terms, make accurate statements, how to construct an argument, how to detect, detect fallacies in argument. Thirdly, he learned to express himself in language, how to say what he had to say elegantly and persuasively. So whatever subject is then pursued, the point is that the pupil has first learned to handle the tools of learning. With these tools, any subject may be mastered. With these tools, we can, she says, produce a society of educated people fitted to preserve their intellectual freedom amid the complex pressures of our modern society. With these tools, they can carve out their character. So these tools have been lost, but we do have a new sort of trivium today, the trivial and depressing trivium of equality, diversity and inclusion, or EDI. Like what Sayers says about the trivium, these new tools are not learning, but a preparation for learning. And like the trivium, with these new tools in hand, the pupil or student can approach any subject. Of course, there's a crucial difference. For these tools of EDI are very blunt tools. They tend to reduce any subject to which they are applied to the same state of ruin. With EDI as a hammer, every subject looks like a nail. The only discovery these tools permit is that the whole Western canon is, to use a term much loved by our new EDI educators, problematic. Sexist, racist, homophobic. These new tools produce from every material the same ugly accusatory sculpture. Rather, indeed, than being tools of learning, the EDI trivium functions as tools of unlearning. Now, EDI initiatives tend to take the form of expressions of commitment. They, they love commitments or pledges. Commitment to what are evidently political goals. If you take a look at a, for instance, at an email I recently received, just five days ago, the newly appointed Vice President of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at my university, University College Dublin, sent her first email to faculty since taking up the role. Now, I 
tend to brace myself every time I open an email emanating from the university administration, especially when it concerns EDI, which, considering UCD's express aim of embedding EDI in every aspect of university life, seems ever more frequent. But this missive was even more obnoxious than usual. After a note of syrupy self-congratulation, the first paragraph went like this. In the coming year, we have many challenges and projects, for example, submission of our Athena Swan Silver Institutional Applications and the development of our Anti-Racism Action Plan. Action plans to continue pushing for Athena Swan Awards and to further anti-racism initiatives. And the university presents these as commitments and expects every member of its community to be on board, to promote it, to structure everything they do in the university with these commitments to the fore. Athena Swan, for those lucky enough not to know what it is, is a charter set up in 2005 by the UK-based charity Advance HE, or Higher Education, originally to further the prospects of women in the sciences. SWAN stands for the Scientific Women's Academic Network. Athena SWAN Ireland was launched in 2015 and now pushes for gender equality across all disciplines in the university. It functions as a, an accreditation system. Universities and departments send applications for awards to Athena SWAN based on submitted action plans to tackle gender issues. Successful applications can be awarded bronze, silver, and gold badges, which institutions and individual departments can then proudly display on their website. Higher education institutes and their constituent departments and schools all over Ireland have made or are in the process of making such applications. Now, what do these applications consist of? Well, to begin an application, a department head of school or college principal completes a letter, the template of which is provided on the Athena Swan Ireland website. Here's the first line. Dear head of Athena Swan Ireland, on behalf of, name of institution, so like a school of philosophy, on behalf of the school of philosophy, I wish to pledge my commitment to the principles of the Athena Swan Ireland Charter. Now, that already should set alarm bells ringing, even before we see what the principles are. But when we see the principles, it's obvious that they are politically and philosophically contentious. They are issues that are or should be subjects of academic and political debate. Thus, to take a particularly notorious commitment, an applicant for the award must pledge, and pledge his colleagues too, or her colleagues, to foster collective understanding that individuals have the right to determine and affirm their gender, and commit to implementing inclusive and effective policies and practices that are cognizant of the lived experiences and needs of trans and non-binary people. So every single participant in the Athena Swan scheme in Ireland has thus committed, or has been committed, to embracing and promoting gender ideology. Other pledges involve commitments to the notion of intersection intersectionality, and indeed a commitment to accepting that unconscious bias and institutional sexism are real things and to undergo mandatory training and unconscious bias. Now, you might ask, why would any academic agree to such commitments? Well, one clear reason is that they have to. In order to be eligible for government funding, institutions must show they are engaging with the US1. It is, in other words, a sanction-led initiative, and that's how its proponents actually describe it. The importance of being tied to funding is, is readily admitted. As one Irish academic who was involved in setting up Athena Swan writes, of immense significance was the further underpinning of the Higher Education Authority's endorsement of Athena Swan with the policy of linking Athena Swan to funding of higher education institutes and research. So they call it an effective stick. This is actually in the literature. It's an effective stick to force universities to apply for such awards. Of course, that might not seem sufficient as an explanation. Uh, I mean, these remarks, these, these threatening remarks, it's an effective stick to get you to to get involved. They are appalling. They should disgust anyone who believes in academic freedom or freedom of speech in general. Indeed, that Athena Swan Ireland can present such threats goes against the protections in, of academic freedom in Ireland's Universities Act. And we have strong protections. In Section 14 of the Universities Act, it's stated that a member of the academic staff of a university shall have the freedom within the law in his or her teaching, research, and any other activities, either in or outside the university, to question and test received wisdom to put forward new ideas and to state controversial or unpopular opinions and shall not be disadvantaged or subject to less favorable treatment by the university for the exercise of that freedom. So why hasn't there been any reaction to this? Or indeed to the Vice President's second announcement, the development of the Anti-Racism Action Plan, which, by the way, is related to Athena Swan Ireland because both are products of Advance HE. 
anti-racism principles come from their race equality charter. So the, the anti-racism action plan involves embracing a set of principles whose, whose title, whose tenor and supporting materials unmistakably link the campaign to critical race theory, the controversial academic associ um, movement associated with divisive activist academics such as Ibram X. Kendi. The tool has been imposed on Irish universities from above, from the Irish Higher Education Authority, an organization that seems thoroughly corrupted beyond repair. No one has questioned the co coherency of the HEA's expressed aim of race equality, with its goal of equal outcomes, and its stance adopted from Kennedy that race inequality or any disparity in outcomes between individuals of different races is conclusive proof of racism, admitting of no further possible cause. So, given that Athena Swan and the Anti-Racism Action Plan are both politically and philosoph philosophically partisan, and given that we have in Ireland very good protection in the law for academic freedom, why has there been no pushback? A couple of reasons come to mind. First, there is an incredible, a startling amount of ignorance regarding academic freedom among Irish academics. That's one reason. But secondly, the more obvious reason is the political and ideological biases of the vast majority of academics is such that they believe in these principles. Athena Swan has been described as the imposition of gender feminism throughout the academy, and the academy is full of gender feminists and their enablers. And one might present a third reason. Aside from the true believers, one imagines there are academics who just want to get on with their teaching and research and publishing and keep their head down. And to avoid these political maneuvers and, and work towards their next promotion. As, as Susan Hawke puts it, to be an academic today, to be an academic today, there's a strong temptation to be an ostrich, to get on quietly with your own work and do your best to ignore the noisy battles around you. Now, perhaps that is possible in some disciplines, but when you are an academic in a discipline like philosophy, or simply an academic with any self-respect, it is more difficult. When, as Hawke puts it, the great revolutionary chorus is announcing that disinterested inquiry is impossible, that all supposed knowledge is expressions of power, that the concepts of evidence, objectivity, truth, and ide our ideological humbug, it is hard to ignore. Because if you keep your head down in the face of that noise, you are betraying your discipline, your university, your students, and ultimately yourself. I'm reminded of the, the, the whistleblower of police corruption in New York, Frank Serpico, who was played by Al Pacino in the 1973 film, Serpico. When Pacino went to him to visit him when he was preparing for the role, and he asked him, why did you step forward? Serpico replied, well, Al, I don't know. I guess I would have to say it would be because if I didn't, who would I be when I listened to a piece of music? To conclude, I should like to think that were I myself an advocate of the policies pushed by Athena Swan and Advance HE, gender ideology and critical race theory, anti-racism, if I myself were an advocate of such policies, I would hope that I would still balk at the idea of demanding that colleagues, current and future, would commit to these things. I should like to think that I would still, as a scholar and academic, resist calls to institutionalize such ideologies in the university. But then again, I fear, were I indeed a committed advocate of such policies, pushing for and welcoming the embedding in the university of these illiberal ideologies would be precisely what I would be doing, judging as merited the sacrifice of academic freedom and free expression at the altar of gender and racial equality, and identifying protests to such sacrifice as evidence of misogyny, transphobia, homophobia, patriarchal heteronormativity, white supremacy, systemic racism, etc., etc. This is what we are up against. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, so if you don't want to answer a question, ask a question, or you don't want to make a statement, put up your hand, and then I'll come to all the other people. Does anyone have anything they want to say, any, any, any sort of comment at this point? Yes, sir. Keep your comments, if you can, brief I, to the point. I think there was on. a problem of terminology when you said that we don't want um, um, a progressive education replaced by conservative uh, education. I would say, oh, that's a very difficult and complex question. 
-hmm. If you would say, we don't want a left-wing education replaced by a right-wing education, then you would say, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. But can I ask you, is it not the case that if classical education is a conservative education, Joanna said that, then surely if you were a green or a leftist, you'd want to get rid of classical education. I don't know. I know leftists who would uh, totally embrace classical education in, this, in the sense we know it. Okay. Not wokists, of course. Okay, very good. Somebody else? Someone else who's not spoken today. Yes, mm. here we go. <coughs> Thanks a lot for this very interesting uh, day. I wanted to um, go back to what the last speaker says about the national government funding of certain projects or curricula. I wanted to make a parallel with the European Union. I worked for the Erasmus Plus program before and uh, handing out scholarships to university consortia that develop projects in line with the Bologna process to reform the university studies. And they uh, are being given priorities, topics, along which they shall deliver, uh, develop a project. Like, for example, uh, ecology, inclusion, integration of mi migrants, smart cities, everything that's part of this vogue culture. <laughs> Partly, not all, not all. And uh, they are then selected along this line. So we have a whole bunch of projects that are on these topics because these are like compulsory um, to receive a grant. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing at European level and also outside Europe for consortia mm -hmm. of European and, uh, uh, yeah, and b bigger scale. Right, so what Tim is saying you're saying is part of the, the, the system generally. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a, very, a very short and general question. We are in Brussels, <laughs> and what does the EU really do here? And what kind of commissions or, or levels or organizations should be uh, held accountable for what is doing? This is the place where we should find some solutions at least we should identify who are who need we uh, observe and influence from our point from our point of view. Okay. No. Okay. I think it's slightly unfortunate um, to tie the word conservative to classical education um, or liberal education and, and it's not liberal of course in the sense of liberal party politics it's liberal in the sense that it's a liberating education mm -hmm. people who have this education are free freed um, because certainly in Britain you'd be very unwise to entrust um, the promotion of classical or liberal education to the Conservative Party that's done at least as much damage to it as the, um, uh, the Labour Party, not least, by introducing a national curriculum in 1989, which I think was a very unconservative thing to do. So I, I think we should stress that what we're promoting is something that, you know, when I started in universities, um, the idea of um, what, what Tim has been saying about academic freedom um, would have been shared by maybe not by a few Trotskyites that there were around, but, but by people from all different um, points of view. Um, so, I, so I just say that as a, as a note of caution. I, I find actually what Tim has described is, is absolutely sickening, but it's not atypical. But we shouldn't forget who were the biggest supporters of the Nazis in 1933. I'll leave that as a rhetorical question. Joanna, did I hear you correctly when you said that you thought that a classical education reinforces values like the idea of nationhood and like traditional conservative values? So, yeah, but, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I, I, 
had thought I said, but I obviously, it's my fault, I obviously hadn't made it clear. Uh, in no way do I mean conservative as in the Conservative Party. I'm meaning conservative as in the project of to conserve, um, uh, conserving a sense of knowledge, a sense of culture. But I do think that that is bound up in the project of the nation state as well, because I think, you know, I'm going back to Durkheim here. Uh, Durkheim writes that the school is the only moral agent through which the child is able to systematically learn how to know and love his country. But, but for Durkheim, my, my interpretation of that is that love of country is not an end in itself. You know, he's not trying to um, build a, an army of little patriots, but a means by which our children are helped to feel a deep sense of commitment, uh, a shared community that predates their existence yeah, and will continue but is it, after their yeah, death. But is it not the case then that conservative, not as in political, but conservative, a conservative education, would be seen by some as being anathema to the idea of the type of no borders, oh, no nationhood. Yeah. 100%, but then that's our challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're gonna make the case for classical education, I think we do need to um, push back against those people. Actually, uh, the thing is more straightforward because if you look at the 19th, 20th century, everybody uh, with a brain cell would have bought into what we call classical education. So Marx himself wrote at length uh, about the importance of the Greeks and the Romans. And he himself uh, was a scholar of the antiquities, wrote his uh, gymnasium thesis on Augustus and, uh, and, his, and, and the Augustus, the emperor, you know, sort of, and, and the important role that he, he played. Gramsci, who uh, very often is criticized by people who have never read him. Gramsci's book on hegemony uh, and on education is all about the celebration of classical education. And if you look back at the debate that occurred in Italy between Gramsci and Mussolini, you will find that Mussolini was on the side of skills. He wanted to introduce skills education within fascistic Italy and Gramsci argued that that would be a disaster for his children. He, he actually wrote quite clearly that, you know, my son, you need to embrace and internalize the legacy of the past, the classics, the great classics. So in those days, although there were big ideological differences on everything, there was no difference about the importance of internalizing the legacy of Western culture. Nobody argued like Foucault and others later on, that there's something ideological about it or there's something wrong about it. They basically understood that uh, the legacy of Western civilization was non-negotiable and that everybody had to be able to embrace that. Right? So it's quite important to realize. So to that extent, you know, we are now in a situation with that tradition of understanding the importance of Western civilization as something they want to transmit to our young people, we, we are now in a very small minority. And not the small minority isn't just simply to do with the fact that there are people on the other side, anti-conservatives, but even within conservatism, right? even within conservatism, there are real hostile, if you look at some of the curriculums that were brought in by the conservative parties, not just in Britain, but elsewhere, they were the skills agenda. They were about social engineering. They were about a, a utilitarian turn within the education system. And most conservative uh, educators who are part of political movements are still imbued with that. And although now and again they play uh, rhetorical lip service to the importance of classical education, very often the only way they can defend classical education is by saying that classical education is actually good for the economy. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know what I mean, you look at the Oxford University's classical website, classical studies website, and how do they justify classical education in Oxford on their website? They justify it on the grounds that we have very good employment consequences. When, when people leave Oxford University, our students do really, really well in their job. Um, obviously they do, because only the smartest kids you know, do classical education. But the fact that you have to justify classical education by values that are external to it indicates that the genuine supporters of this particular project are conspicuously small at the moment. Thank you. 
Okay. What we'll do is we're going to go through the panel once more, and we'll wrap up a little early and move on to the conclusion. But Tim, I wanted to ask you, it was really, um, your presentation was very striking, your experience is very striking um, and uh, quite depressing. Um, what do you, what hopes do you hold for the chance that at some point people will see that the politicization of the university, the um, clampdown on thought and speech is just not a good idea. Do you see any hope among some of your students who actually say, no, I want to have a debate about that? Um, I, I think um, you know, with the students, sometimes there is cause for optimism. I think a lot of this seems to wash over them and they don't buy into it. But then, see, it's not, it's not that they're going to react against it. They're in, in the same position as some of the academics who let it wash over them and don't stand up to it. So, um, uh, but it, it, I, I am kind of optimistic. Um, I think one thing you should always do is let them know what your position is. So, for instance, when my, my school of philosophy is, is currently um, putting together its application, and the applications for Athena Swan, they, they take ages. They're, they're, they're like uh, short novels. These, they're huge applications. They take up the time for at least a year for up to two or three academics, maybe even more who are sitting on a committee doing this stuff. And when they started it, they asked me to, to join the group as if to um, defuse me or just to uh, co-opt me. And I, I told them, that if I'm part of the application, it's definitely going to fail. And, but so at least, they, I mean, they asked me knowing what my views are because it was a previous, a previous battle over the Society for Women in Philosophy, which they were bringing in, which I, I told what my views were. So it's always important to let them know, because then you find they will, they will tread a little bit softer around you. As for causes for optimism, um, I launched with the Irish Federation of University Teachers, a union that I'm involved with, uh, which was founded on the principles of academic freedom. I launched the Dublin, the Dublin Lectures in Academic Freedom last uh, April, and we had Terence Caron coming over to give a talk. And I invited the new president, Orla Feely to come and give and launch it, and actually she hadn't quite taken up the president's role yet, so it was it was like her first engagement, and I I wrote the speech for her, and it's it's on video, so she can't say she didn't do it, and, uh, <laughs> and I think I introduced her to the Calvin Report as well, which she later on mentioned herself in relation to Israel and Hamas, but um, so uh, she was very positive about academic freedom. The, the, a day or two later, she was in the Irish Times talking about the importance of free speech. And I, I praised her on Twitter. She liked my praise, and uh, we were like best friends. And then, <laughs> then suddenly in September, she, she signs the anti-racism principles. Now, you could say where her hands tied, because it was already there. It was from, it's coming down from the HEA, the Higher Education Authority. So mm -hmm. perhaps okay. she didn't do much about it. Or she could have said, no, I'm president. Mm -hmm. I'm not signing it. I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. And I wrote an open letter to her, which, which she didn't like mm -hmm. at that time. <laughs> um, but so I, but I, I think showing that you're in disagreement, and then constantly pressing on academic freedom. Mm -hmm. And now with, um, well, Dennis has left, but Dennis Hayes, who is well known as the director of okay. AFAF, he came over to Dublin. We've launched the Dublin University's AFAF, and I'm going to um, keep pushing uh, the cause of academic freedom mm -hmm. and just tell them we have great protections. Thanks. So let's use it. Thanks. Liliana. A whole new curriculum, it looks like, in Poland then, oh, since you God. changed government. Is there any hopes that you have that maybe teachers, maybe parents um, in Poland will try to insist and hold on just to some of the basic, um, the basic ideas of a classical education as opposed to swallowing the full-scale political indoctrination of new regime, new, new curriculum? New regime, maybe it's too much for now, I would say. Um, but yes, there are already some voices uh, of parents, of schools, of course, not of the students, because, uh, you know, depending, of course, on the age, but if you look at the primary school, they are not too conscious, actually, to decide on what they really want to study, so they need a good influence of the good teachers and the parents. But there are already some voices uh, in the answer of what's happening right now with the new, as you mentioned, I wouldn't say the regime, but with the new uh, reform that is uh, going to be introduced uh, into the school. So let's say there is some hope, but 
I'm not very optimistic okay. uh, for the future, to be honest, because uh, looking at what's happening, uh, if you would ask me one year ago, I would be much more optimistic. Uh, I thought that Poland is still a safe spot. But to be honest, I believe Hungary is the last safe spot on the uh, European uh, or in the, even in the, on the world map. Mm. Joanna, what I want to ask you in conclusion briefly is that it would seem to me that teachers themselves should be the front line of defense against the politicization of education. And it makes no difference whether a teacher is green, left, or right wing. Surely teachers pursuing a Socratic type of principle in the way conversations are conducted in class means that many views could be expressed and explored and interrogated without them looking on the classroom as being a place for them to put forward their views. What are your hopes that teachers and teaching can be saved? At the moment, zero. <laughs> um, but I, I do take your point, and I, I think it's very, very important. And every so often we get these calls, uh, mainly in the US and in relation to higher education, that there should be almost quotas where at job interviews uh, in a kind of McCarthyite system, people are asked to uh, kind of declare their voting intentions in the next election, and you'll fill your faculty with kind of equal representation of, of left and right wing. And, you know, that makes my blood run cold, and, and I don't see any uh, point in engaging engaging in such exercises, and I don't think education would be better uh, as a result. I, you know, I think you're absolutely right. It shouldn't matter what the teacher's educational views, uh, teacher's political views are, but that assumes um, a knowledge centered classical curriculum where the, the knowledge that's being transmitted is uh, seen as being worth what is a it's there it exists as a body of knowledge waiting to be transmitted and there's a sense that this knowledge is sufficiently important in its own terms that it's uh, more important than any political project uh, that you might want to engage in i did just want to come back briefly uh, yet again because i still don't think i've really made myself terribly clear to the whole kind of meaning of conservative i certainly in the uk i mean we've been ruled by conservative government uh, for the vast majority of the past five decades, I would divide them into two groups. I think there are Philistine technocrats, and then there are the woke true believers um, that, are, that are forming the basis of our uh, government, current conservative government, which has been in office uh, for the past, well, over 10 years. And, and I'm not sure which of those two I hate most, the Philistine technocrats or the woke true believers, but I don't think there's one kind of true political conservative anywhere near the Conservative Party um, as it stands in the UK right now and in most other countries uh, throughout Europe. Um, you know, but, but again, that, that's not at all what I was trying to imply for education. You know, what I'm looking at for education, I think if we uh, have the concept of classical education, which I'm certainly taking away uh, from this conference, is, is a concept which is, is, is premised upon the legacy of the past. And, and for me, that links a, a sense of, of passing on the, the transmission, you know, is not to say, let, let's transmit this so you completely rip it all up and start again. You know, you, you do actually want young people, I think, to have some appreciation uh, of the best that's been thought and said, to go back to Matthew Arnold, you know, to, to, to genuine, I mean, they may go on, fair enough, way, and, and, and change and transform society as they see fit, not as I see fit, but as they see fit in the future. Uh, and, you know, I think m my job, the teacher's job, is not telling them what that future should be, uh, to go back to Dewey or Counts, that, that's for them to decide. But, but again, to come back to the theme of the conference, to take responsibility for the world as such, to seek to conserve the best that's been thought and said in the minds of those young people, for them to do what they see fit with. Thank you very Sorry, much. Uh, can, I, can I just have yep, uh, one sure. thought? Because there was a comment uh, <laughs> regarding the, 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 the place where we are right now, that we are in Brussels, yes, and who should be accountable? Well, to be honest, I don't want Brussels to be <laughs> accountable for anything. Um, I mean, uh, at looking, you know, uh, at the current situation with the change of treaties, you know, Brussels will decide whether in Poland uh, we will have, a, I don't know, new investment uh, connected to the nuclear power plant or uh, the huge uh, airline hub. No, I, I don't want Brussels to interfere in any other um, spectrums of, of 
education or any other. So I don't think that the, mm -hmm. this should be the place where we should decide about how the education system should look like. Tim, if you can do it in two sentences, yes. I can yes. do it in two seconds. Okay. I, just, I do want to respond. <laughs> I don't believe you. The, the lady who asked the question uh, about the EU has funding. Was it uh, just, I couldn't see what yes. the microphone was. Actually. Down here at the back, yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. It's, um, that's, that's a great point. I would say quickly that actually that would, that would serve as an argument against why we should have Athena Swan as this extra umbrella body in Ireland. Because if it's already, if there's a similar thing about inclusion and diversity in the EU, because there's a difference between acknowledging, for instance, gender ideology and being a cheerleader for gender ideology, which is what Athena Swan wants us to do. So it's a very good question. Uh, was it you in the red asked the question? Thank you. So it's a good question, but I, I would actually take it as something, as a reason, another reason why we should get rid of it. And also because it's a UK thing, which uh, in the UK, it's, it's no longer tied to funding. It's the Irish government that's tied to funding. But thank you for that question. Hey, would you please give the panel a round of uh, applause, please? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, well, uh, thank you everybody for coming. And this has been a, a tiring day for a lot of people. It's been a tiring two day for even more uh, people. I just want to say that uh, we could uh, become very self-indulgent and we could say how difficult